The scripture reading will be from Matthew 21, verses 23 through 27, and will be projected on either side of me here if you don't have a Bible available. 21, verses 23 through 27. Now when he came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? But Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, where is it from? From heaven or from men? And they reasoned among themselves saying, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, we fear the multitude for all count John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus and said, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Good morning. It's really good to look out and see uh, a pretty full house today. And the reason I say that is Brother Harold mentioned the big crowd that we had, and it was just pointed out to me a few moments ago. We have record attendance today. I, don't, I didn't get the actual number, but today is a record, a new record uh, of our attendance. And I'm looking at the board back there, and it says 188. So if, that's, if that was our old record, we've beat that today. And so that's pretty good. We are glad that you're here. We're glad that you've shown an interest in the things that we're trying to do at this place. And we hope you'll come back time and time again. If you're visiting with us, you are most welcome. We are so pleased that you've chosen to be with us. And we hope that you'll come back and, and, and that you will ask questions and that you will study with us and learn with us and grow with us. We have nothing to offer you here except the Word of God. Uh, we're not here to entertain you. We're not here to feed you. We're here to give you scripture, book, chapter, and verse. That is our aim, that's our plea, and we hope that that plea will bring you back. That coupled with the great friendliness that you'll find in the disciples here. If you hang around after services, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. The folks here are most warm and most welcoming, and we hope those two things will bring you back over and over again. If you've been here the last few weeks, you may have noticed a little bit of a theme to the preaching that I've been doing over the last few weeks. Uh, two or three weeks ago, we talked about the ultimate authority, the authority of God. How that God has absolute and ultimate authority to do whatever He wills and that He is not subject to our moral judgments and to our analysis. As God, He can do whatever He wills. And then last week, we talked about respect for authority on all levels. We talked about civil authority. And we talked about authority in the home. And we talked about authority in the congregation. And so respect for authority at all levels. Today we're going to be talking about the authority of Scripture, Bible authority as you can see. We're going to engage in a study of Bible authority. What I'm really talking about today, uh, people will look at the Bible and say, you know that was written a long, long time ago in a different place, in a different time. How can I take this book and use it today and know what it is that God would want me to be and know what it is that God would want me to do and how I should worship and so forth? How can we make use of of the scriptures. A lot of people do not understand this. It's a very important and very critical study. And I think we begin the study with the text that was just read in our hearing in Matthew chapter 21. You know, Jesus was confronted many times. A lot of people think that Jesus, when he came to the earth, uh, everybody just loved him. And that's not really true. The biggest majority of the people hated his guts. And they crucified him for that very reason, because they could not stand him, and they could not stand what he stood for, they could not stand what he was preaching because sometimes he could get under your skin because he would tell you the truth above all things he would tell you the truth well in this particular case we have Jesus being confronted once again uh, and, and they're questioning his authority by what right or by what authority or by what power do you do the things you're doing let's begin reading in verse 23 when he came into the temple the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching and they said by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority those are two very important questions that they ask him 
and they understand two very important principles. First of all, that if you're going to do something in the name of the Lord, you need to have authority for what you're doing. So that first question, by what authority? That implies that we need authority. We need permission. We need someone to guide us, someone to tell us what to do. And so authority is something that is needed. And that's implied in their first question. The second question, who gave you this authority? That tells us that that authority has to come from the right place. It can't just come from me. You can't just say, well, I did this because I think we should do this. Or I did this because uh, the rest of the community thinks we should do this. Who gave you this authority? And so that authority must come from the right place. It must come from the top. And in this context, of course, that's God. And then as, as this discussion continues, uh, Jesus in verse 24 says, I, I'm going to answer your question with the question. He said, I will ask you this one thing, and if you answer me, if you tell me, I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Verse 25, the baptism of John. Where was it from? From heaven or from men? Now we learned something from Jesus' question there too. That when it gets right down to it, when you boil it all down, there's only two places, two sources of authority. Either you're, you're, you're getting your permission to act or your authority to act, your authorization from heaven, that is from God, or you're getting it from men. And when you boil it all down, that's it. There's no other alternative. It's either from heaven or it's from men. It's from God or it's from uh, human beings. So there are only two sources of authority. So this makes a great opening text. And remember those three points. We need authority, number one. Number two, that authority must come from the proper source. And number three, there's only two sources of authority, heaven or men. And of course, we're interested in what heaven has to say this morning. So let's talk about this. And the first point we want to make, we want to talk about the source of Bible authority. And, and when I say Bible authority, let me, under, let, me, let me clarify this. We're talking about authorization, permission to act. Uh, that's what we're really talking about. And it's very important that we understand where that comes from. First of all, we're not going to find proper authority from the doctrines of men and from the doctrines of the Old Testament. Turn your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew chapter 15. Another one of those confrontations that Jesus had with the people of His day. And He makes an interesting observation in Matthew 15 and verse 7. He tells the Jews right to their face, you're just a bunch of hypocrites. He says in verse 7, hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. There are a lot of people like that in the world. Oh, how I love Jesus, just like we sang a little while ago. A lot of people can sing that and say that and claim that they love the Lord, but Jesus says, your heart is far from me. You say one thing with your mouth, but your heart isn't there. And he says this in verse 9, In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. The word vain there means it's useless. It is of no value. And notice the word worship. Your worship can be vain. Your worship can be useless. Your worship can be of no value. When is that true? When does that happen? He says teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And so that authority cannot come from what men say. I don't care who the man is. From, from the Pope or from the human creeds that men devise and write, that authority is from the wrong source. You can't get it from the doctrines of men. Not only that, but it is a mistake to think that we can get our authority from the Old Testament. Move over a couple of pages, over to Matthew 17. We have the story of the transfiguration of Jesus. We won't read the whole thing, but you can read it at your leisure. We're, we're squeezed for time here, so we won't read it all, but we'll make note of it here. Jesus takes His three closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, off to a mountain by themselves. And He is transfigured. That means His form changes. He no longer has the appearance of a mortal man, but the divine glory shows through. You see, Jesus was God in the flesh. And so His divine glory shows through, and, and one of the gospel accounts says His garments became white, white as snow, whiter than any fuller could have washed or could have cleansed them. And so He was very, very bright, very white. His divine glory was showing, and right next to Him is Moses and Elijah. Now get the picture here. You have a representation of Jesus in the middle, and you have Moses representing the law, the Old Testament, and you have Elijah representing the prophets of the Old Testament. And Peter, he's just enamored by this, wouldn't you be? And he says, Lord, it's, it's great for us to be here. Let's make three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And then God kind of settles the discussion. And he says, look here at this one in the middle. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Now get the implication. Today, 
we no longer listen to Moses. We don't know, Moses had his place and he had a law. It was given to the Jews. It was given for the Jews. We no longer listen to Moses. We no longer listen to Elijah and the prophets. But we listen to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And that's why when we talk about the source of authority, it has to be the New Testament will of Jesus. You're not going to find permission to do things that please God from the Old Testament. You're going to find that permission from the New Testament. You're going to find it in the will of Jesus. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 28 and verse 18, just before He ascended up into heaven to sit down at the right hand of God and to begin His reign, He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And all there means all. He has it in heaven. He has it on earth. Jesus rules. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. He has all authority. Moses doesn't have any authority. Elijah doesn't have any authority. Lanny Smith doesn't have any authority. It all belongs to Jesus Christ. And James tells us in James 4 and verse 12, there's one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? That one lawgiver being Jesus Christ. Now Jesus had some help. He had some men that he called apostles, and he chose them to leave us a written record of his will. In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 through 5, we won't read uh, all the section, but if you were to read verses 1 through 7, and you were to give a title to that, I would call it How We Got Our Bible. And in verse 3, he says, How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in a few words, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ which in the other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by His Spirit to His holy apostles and prophets. God chose apostles and God chose prophets. And He revealed His will to them. Jesus Christ revealed His will to them. And Paul says we wrote it down in verse 3. We wrote it down in a few words. And when you read, you can understand. And so they left us a written record. This is how God has chosen to communicate with us. He doesn't communicate to us with visions and dreams, but He communicates to us in writing. He communicates to us in the Bible, particularly in the New Testament portion where we listen to the will of Jesus. And He says, when you read, you can understand it. And that's Scripture. The beautiful thing about the Lord is He, he never does anything halfway. And the beautiful thing about Scripture is that everything I need to know about being saved and going to heaven and living a Christian life is right here in this book. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says all scripture. Remember, the apostles wrote it down. And 2 Timothy 3 says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Everything I need to know is right here in this book. What must I do to be saved? Here it is. How do I worship God? Here it is. How do I live, conduct myself as a Christian? Here it is. How do I conduct myself as a husband? Here it is. How do I conduct myself as a father? It's right here. How do I behave at work? Right here. It's all here. Everything you need to know right here in this book. And so the source of authority is not the will of men, the doctrines of men, or the doctrines of the Old Testament, but it is the will of King Jesus as set forth in the New Testament. Now let's talk about how we're going to use that New Testament. How do we establish Bible authority. I put some initials up there. You'll see C-E-N-I, and I'll explain what all that means here in just a minute. But how do we go to the Scripture and, and determine God's will? You know, God uses common sense principles. And God teaches us exactly the same way that all teaching is done. And I think that's, a, a, that's an amazing thing. All teaching, whether you're teaching your children, you know, we have a lot of little ones here and we're teaching them and we're bringing them up and we're trying to raise them into responsible adults. But all teaching, whether you're teaching children or whether you're teaching someone a new job at work or, or whether you're being teaching children at school or whether you're teaching the Bible, all teaching is done the same way. First of all, there are direct statements. Think about that with your children. Shut the door. Pick up your toys. Sit down and be quiet. Those are direct statements. You're making direct statements to your children. And that's how you teach them. You teach them by direct statements. When you go to work, you're taught the same way. You're taught a new job. They say, we want you to do this and we want you to do that. And you're taught by direct statements. But we're also taught by example. Years ago, before I started preaching on a full-time basis, I used to work in a plastics factory. I was a lab manager, and I worked in a lab, and we conducted experiments, and we developed new products. I was in research and development, and we developed new products. And there was a new guy that came along. I, at, at one time, I was the only fellow in the lab. The company was small at the time, but as the company grew, we brought in another guy. 
and I had to train him. And so I would instruct him about the chemicals and what chemicals did what and how much chemical to put in this product and how much chemical to put in that product and where they would be found. And so I would teach him by direct statements and I would also take him out on the floor and show him, here is where you'll find this chemical. Here is where you'll find that chemical. Here are the scales. Here's how you weigh it. And so you show them, you tell them, and you show them. And then you imply things. Think about that with your children. You'll say something like, you know, children who don't pick up their toys don't get to eat any ice cream. Now you've just implied something, haven't you? And what you've done is that you've implied to your child, I want you to pick up the toys. You didn't say, go pick up the toys. You implied that that's what you wanted. Because if they don't pick them up, they won't get any ice cream. Mom and Dad will be sitting there eating ice cream, but you're not going to be eating any ice cream because you didn't pick your toys up. And so there's implication. The scripture is exactly the same way. Let me show you. 1 Corinthians 14. And that, that, that brings us to the first letter, C. That means command. In 1 Corinthians 14, in verse 37, Paul winds up this discussion here about spiritual gifts. And in verse 37, just before the end of the chapter there, he says, If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, that is to say, if you think you know something about God's will, then let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the suggestions of the Lord. That's not what it says, is it? The things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. Those are statements. I made some statements here about how to conduct yourself in our public assemblies. That's what the whole chapter is all about. How you're going to conduct yourself in our public assemblies. And the things that I'm writing here are not suggestions. They are commandments. And so God teaches us by commandments. Isn't that amazing? Just the same way you would teach your children. Shut the door. Pick up your toys. God says the same thing to us. Behave yourselves. Walk in the light. And so he teaches us by command. And then moving over to the 16th chapter, we learn that God teaches us by example. The church at Corinth was being instructed to collect funds for needy Christians in Jerusalem. And as Paul sets this up in verse 1, notice what he says. Now concerning the collection for the saints, watch this. As I have given order to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. Do you realize what he just said? That brings us to the second letter, E, example. And what he's saying is he, he says, I gave the churches of Galatia over there some instructions. And I want you to do exactly the same thing I told them to do. You follow their example. And so even today we follow that example. On the first day of the week, we did it just a little while ago. On the first day of the week, verse 2, let every one of you lay something aside storing up. That's why we took up a collection. And that's why you won't find us taking up a collection tomorrow night. You won't find us taking up a collection Wednesday night or Friday night. You'll find us taking up a collection on the first day of the week, on Sunday, because we follow that example that's found in Scripture. If the Corinthians could do it and the Galatians can do it, you can bet on it, bank on it, that the church at Fishers can do it and be on safe, solid ground. That's biblical. And then there's that third thing, the implication. N-I stands for necessary implication. I think it's important to understand that we're talking about implications that cannot be avoided. Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 16. Acts 16. And, and this is a beautiful picture of an implication in Scripture. Now, Paul and Timothy are on a preaching journey. And in verse 9, it says, A vision appeared to Paul in the night. God gives him a vision. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. My new King James uses the word concluding. The old King James, an interesting expression, assuredly gathering. That's the same thing as saying necessarily inferring. And the word that's translated concluding there, or assuredly gathering, I took the liberty of actually looking that up this morning in Vine's Dictionary, and it means to put together in one's mind, to infer. That's exactly what the word conclude means there. To put together in one's mind, to infer. Now what they did was they put two and two together. Paul and Silas and Timothy are on a preaching journey. They're preaching the gospel. And suddenly God sends a vision. And the vision doesn't say come and preach the gospel. It just says come over here to Macedonia and help us. And they put this all together. Preaching journey, inspired of God, vision that says come here and help us. And we conclude 
lo and behold, God must want us to preach the gospel to the people of Macedonia. That's a necessary implication. And it's the same way all teaching is done. People today will, will question these things. Folks, that, that's just questioning common sense. That's question. In fact, especially on necessary implication, I heard the story one time where a, a guy challenged the preacher on that. He said, he said, now, now, you know that, that the Bible can't, doesn't teach by necessary implication. And the preacher looked at him and he said, well, any idiot knows that the Bible teaches by implication. And the man got offended. And he said, I don't appreciate being called an idiot. And the preacher said, I didn't call you an idiot. He said, well, you inferred it. And the preacher said, case closed. That's the way teaching is done, isn't it? We teach, we speak by implication. We certainly do. Direct statements, approved examples, and necessary implications. Let's make a hard and fast application of this. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we just did this a few moments ago, the Lord's Supper. And we learn here, by direct statement or command, that's the first one, that we're to do this. Verses 23 through 26. Paul says, I receive from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, Take, eat, for this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. That has the force of a command. Do this. In the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he come. We learn by commandment, by direct statement, that we are to take bread and fruit of the vine. That's exactly what we did. We did exactly what the scripture says. We took the unleavened bread, we took the fruit of the vine, and we did that in memory of Christ. And notice verse 26, you do this till the Lord comes. That tells me that this is a permanent thing. It was not just something for the first century. It was not just something for the church at Corinth. This was something that's to be done by all disciples until the Lord returns. Well, when are we supposed to do this? In Acts 20 and verse 7, the Bible tells us that it's done on the first day of the week. On the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, it says, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. That's an example. We know that they did it on the first day of the week. And so we learn by example that we also can do it on the first day of the week. Now, when we talk about implication, necessary implication, did you know, I know it's going to shock you, but I, did you know that every week has a first day in it? It surely does. Every week has a first day in it. And we have equal authority to take the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. Every time that first day of the week rolls around, we are authorized, we are permitted, we have the authority to take the Lord's Supper. That's sound and solid biblical reasoning. You will not find us taking it on Monday. You will not find us taking it on Wednesday. You will not find us taking it on Friday or any other day. The scripture says the first day of the week. We are on sound, solid biblical ground when we follow that teaching. That's how Bible authority is established. Let's move quickly. I'm getting a little, a little talkative here. We need to talk about two kinds of authority. There's two ways in which you can authorize something. Generically and specifically. And again, this is just common sense. Generic authority is general in its nature. It is inclusive in its nature. Specific authority is exclusive. Now let me see if I can illustrate this for you. We talk about pain medicine. Now, if you go to the doctor and he says, have you taken any pain medicine? He's just spoken in very generic terms. And it's wide open. Or he might tell you, in order to alleviate this pain you're having, take some pain medicine. Well, if he says pain medicine, the, the door is wide open to just about any kind of pain medicine that you can talk about. We might be talking about Tylenol. We might be talking about Advil. We might be talking about morphine. As you can see, there are various strengths of pain medicine. Some are stronger than others. But if the doctor comes and he says, morphine is the only thing that'll, that'll curb that pain, and he's been very specific, hasn't he? You see, what he's saying is Tylenol is excluded. Tylenol is not going to do the job. Advil is excluded. It's not going to do the job. The only thing that's going to do the job here is morphine. And so that's the nature. And again, notice how common sense that is. We do that all the time. We tell our children, would you go down here to the IGA on the corner and get me a loaf of bread? Now you see what you've done? Will you go down here? He can ride his bike. He can walk. Or if he's old enough, he can get in the car and drive down there. That's generic. 
If you say IGA down here on the corner, you don't mean Marsh halfway across town, do you? IGA right down here on the corner. I've excluded every other store. You say loaf of bread. I don't want him to come back with a pound of hamburger. Loaf of bread. I've excluded every other item in the store by saying loaf of bread. That's common sense, folks. And that's just exactly the way the Bible operates. Let me give you some examples. Three examples. Think about the idea of baptism. Baptism, and we talked about this a little bit, I think it was last Sunday evening. Baptism is a very specific action. The word literally means to immerse. And so that's specific. When Jesus says baptizing them into the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, he's giving a specific action here. You don't sprinkle water on them. You don't pour water on them. You immerse them. But here's a question for you. Where are we going to do that? Where are we going to do that? In Acts 8, we have the story of Philip and the Ethiopian. And as they went down the road, they came to some water. You notice how generic that is? And the eunuch said to Philip, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? He said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch. Three times there he talked about water. Now, I don't know what kind of water that was. I don't know if it was a mud hole. I don't know if it was a river. I don't know if it was a creek. I don't know if it was a lake. But I know it was a body of water big enough to immerse somebody in. And so that's generic. We can put the water right here if we want to. And that's what we've done. You see, we have a tank of water right here. See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And so when the scripture speaks of where to be baptized, that's very generic. You can be baptized in White River. You can be baptized in Morse Reservoir or Geis Reservoir. You can be baptized right here in this baptistry behind me. You can be baptized in a mud hole if it's big enough and deep enough to immerse you in. And so that's generic. Let's think about music in worship. In Ephesians 5 and verse 19, the music that, is, that we're commanded to offer to God is very specific. Ephesians 5, 19, we see that it is to be vocal music. That's why if you're visiting, you will not see a piano or an organ or a band or an orchestra or a guitar or anything else up here because we're trying to do just what God said. In Ephesians 5, 19, it says, Speaking to one another... In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, speaking is vocal. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Speaking and singing are vocal music. God has been very explicit about that, very specific. But now, what part am I going to sing? Bass? Alto? Soprano? Tenor? What part am I going to sing? You see, God didn't really say, Lanny, you have to sing bass. Lanny, you have to sing alto. I'm glad he didn't say, Lanny, you have to sing alto. I'd have a hard time with that one. But you see, he's been very generic in that regard. Must I sing from memory? Or can I sing having the words printed in a songbook? God didn't say, did he? He left that one open. So the kind of music, vocal, is very specific. How it's done, whether by the printed page or from memory, whether I sing bass, alto, soprano, or tenor, that's left up to me. That's generic. And then one more example, the idea of preaching the gospel. Jesus said in Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, when Jesus said go, remember our grocery store illustration? When I go into all the world, I can ride in an airplane. I rode in an airplane once to Nevada to preach. I can drive in my car. Most of the time when I go preach, I get in the car. I can walk down the street to my neighbor's house and preach. I could ride my bicycle and go preach, although I might be winded when I got there. But I can go in any way that God wants me to go. But then Jesus says, preach the gospel. That limits my subject matter. He didn't say, preach whatever you want to. He didn't say, preach what pleases the people. He didn't say, preach whatever they want to hear. He said, preach this. Preach this. That's very specific. But here's the generic part. Where am I going to do that? I have over the years preached in a tent outside in the hot July or August sun. I've done that many times. I've preached in auditoriums like this. I've preached in classrooms. We have classrooms here going down that hallway. I've preached in classrooms. I've preached in people's homes. I've preached on the radio. I've preached on the internet because we record these sermons and we post them on the internet. And God didn't say where that. He just said go and get it done. And so that's generic. And so we have the idea of generic and specific authority. That's that, and, and that's just common sense. 
We do that all the time. And yet for some reason we don't see it when it comes to Scripture. One more thing we need to talk about, and that's the silence of the Scriptures. When God hasn't said anything, listen very carefully. When God hasn't said anything, I'm not authorized to act. I can't do anything if God hasn't said anything. And that should be pretty obvious. You go into McDonald's and you say, I want a McDouble. Yeah, I switched from quarter pounder. I want a McDouble. And they give you a McDouble and then they throw in three orders of fries and two apple pies and three large Cokes and charge you for the whole thing. And you say, what? And they say, you didn't say not to. Now you know you wouldn't put up with that 30 seconds. When you said, I want a McDouble, you excluded everything else. Your silence did not permit them to put all that other junk in your sack and charge you for it. And yet that's what we want to do with God. God says, I want you to do this, and then we want to put all this other junk in the sack and make him pay for it. Doesn't work that way. In Acts chapter 15, they were having an issue about circumcision in the early church. And this really was an issue about uh, something we discussed earlier, and that is the Old Testament versus the New Testament. These Jewish Christians wanted to bind the Old Testament on the Gentiles and make them be circumcised. Well, they met together, they debated, and they argued, and they finally came to a conclusion, a scriptural conclusion, and then they would write a letter to all the churches. And the letter is found in Acts 15, verses 23 to 29. just want to read one verse to make our point here. The apostles are writing, and they said, Since we have heard that some went out from us, have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law. Now get the rest of this verse. To whom we gave no such commandment. Do you understand what he just said? I didn't say that. We didn't say that. We didn't authorize you to go out and preach that. You don't have any right to preach that. We gave no such commandment. We were silent about that. And so when God is silent, I have no permission to act. I cannot assume it's okay to do something when God is silent. And that's why we have to have, you know, the person with the practice has to produce the scripture. That's what I've always said. If you're going to do something religiously, you better have a verse to back it up. The person with the practice has to produce the scripture. Colossians 3.17 says, Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of, and that expression means by the authority of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father through Him. You're going to take the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week? Better have a scripture. You're going to baptize by immersion? Better have a scripture. You're going to baptize by sprinkling? You better have a scripture, and you don't. And you don't, because God never authorized that. He never gave that commandment. And so you begin to see how this fits together. In 2 John 9, John says it this way, Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. The doctrine of Christ, the teaching of Jesus, sets up boundaries. And he says, our job is to stay right inside that teaching. If we step over the line, that's what transgress means. If we step over the line and stay out there, he says, you don't have God. He's not with you any longer. So you've got to stay inside the line. Stay inside the doctrine of Christ. And so, isn't this simple stuff? And yet there's a lot of people who don't grasp this. I want you to understand this is common sense stuff. We use it every day. We use it when we teach our children. You use it when you go to work and you train your employees or they train you. You use it in every aspect of life and God uses it too. Surprise, surprise. All teaching is done that way. If you're here this morning and are not a Christian, let me tell you what you need to do. Direct statement. Except you believe that I am He, you should die in your sins. That's Jesus speaking of His divinity. And He says by direct statement, if you don't believe I'm the Son of God, you will die in your sins. Then Jesus said by direct statement in Luke 13 and verse 3, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And so we need to repent of our sins. Jesus said by direct statement in Matthew 10, verse 32, Whoever confesses me before men, him will I confess before my Father who is in heaven. You must confess the Lord. And you must be baptized. Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. And he who does not believe will be condemned. Those things can be established by direct statement, which we've done. They can be established by approved example, which we could do. And they can be established by necessary implication. All of those things are solidly taught in Scripture. You want to be a Christian? 
You want to be saved from your sins? That's what you need to do. And we're here to help you. If you'll come right now while we stand and while we sing.